Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian in Washington, D.C., where we are meeting with retired Air Force General Phil Breedlove, the former Supreme Allied Commander, uh, Europe. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. It's all good. It's a great day, and we've had a good conference talking about Russia today. Um, absolutely. Uh, uh, you were uh, the keynote speaker at the Atlantic Consul's uh, conference today on Russia. Uh, looking a little bit from the standpoint of the elections, we're also looking at some recommendations for the next administration. Obviously, I'm not going to get you to comment on anything that's going to be election related. But you know, one in your talk, you mentioned sort of the four things that sort of keep you awake or or or, or stress you about the relationship. What are the four things? So these are really sort of leftovers. Uh, our nation has lots of things it needs to work out in its relationship with Russia, but these are four things that today I think about and, and I believe that we need to move forward on. First and foremost, our vector with Russia is not good. Continuing pressure in Crimea, continuing pressure in Georgia, and of course Syria, uh, among others. And so this is uh, something we need to address. I'm worried about what some in Europe call this hybrid war, uh, the Russians call uh, active measures, I sort of call it conflict or competition below the line or below the water line. What uh, Russia is doing in nations that would be short of causing that broader conflict but meeting their objectives. And I think in our own country we see this happening in the elections and what's happening in cyber and others. And so how do we combat this? And every nation is different and they act to a different level. Uh, open force in Ukraine to cyber in the U.S., et cetera, and so war below the lines. I'm worried still, and I talked about it as I departed, about the sort of loose talk about nukes, the fact that nukes are considered a part of a continuum of a, of a, of a conflict is, is really quite concerning. And then finally, in a, in a broad sense, how do you deal with a nation that espouses to this escalate to de-escalate regime of warfare. In other words, whatever you do, we're going to do something harder, deeper, bigger, more spectacular to convince you never to confront us. How do you deal with that in a policy sense? If you capitulate and you don't respond to certain things, then you have legitimized past, past bad behavior. So how do we take on uh, this in a broader policy sense? And well, what are uh, you know, one of the things that you called for was increased, you know, find ways uh, to cooperate with Russians to try to build kernels of uh, trust or, or pockets of, uh, you know, at least mutual agreement and, and dialogue. Obviously, some people are being critical of uh, the administration and Dr. Carter for sort of severing military ties with, with, with the Russians, although from the standpoint of uh, the Pentagon leadership and the administration. It's, you know, we've tried to reach out. We've had numerous conferences. You know, one of the people in the conference joked that, you know, uh, uh, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry and Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, should move in together because they spend so much time together. But from your standpoint, what are some ways to build at least some dialogue that could lead to greater understanding? So something we talked about today, which I think is very important, is deterrence and dialogue go together. And one really doesn't work without the other. We need to be have a firm, strong position on deterrence, one that Russia understands that we will support our allies in, in NATO. And then, secondarily, dialogue. There is a lot of dialogue. I think what we need to do is be more targeted in that such that we are developing those places where we might cooperate or might, uh, you pick the word, cooperate, uh, uh, partner, whatever, to try to reach some measurable, tangible uh, successes. Is that in how we do our exercise regimes? Is that in how our alliance uh, communicates with Russia on these incidents at land, air, and sea? What are those places where we could carve out something that is uh, measurable, demonstrative, and the people can see they had a dialogue, they came to an agreement, they've actually made progress, and we build on those to reestablish the trust, which I think has been lost over the last decade. How do you respond to those who, you know, one of the speakers was, um, you know, in the Bush administration, was in this relationship, has followed the relationship, uh, and said, look, you know, 
the United States has done quite a lot over the decades in order to engage. And in this particular case, and a number of speakers today said, said this, uh, you know, the, the Russians are setting their own agenda, and no matter how you reach out to them, they're not particularly interested in doing that. How do you respond to that? Well, I think we have to be intellectually honest enough to understand that both sides have taken steps which have decreased the dialogue. I mean, after Crimea, NATO cut off all routine communication for a while, and that NATO mine Russian contingent at Shape left uh, uh, Shape and moved to Brussels. And so both sides of the equation have taken steps which have stopped the, uh, the dialogue. And I, I don't question those. That's not my business. I executed the policies that were set forth. But I think we are where we are. And now we have to take those first steps to find out where we can do this. And again, just talking where we both present our side of the equation or our party line is not going to be helpful. We need to find those kernels, as you and I just discussed, where we can find a, a particular set of activities that we can take that are measurable and demonstrative so that people can see results, tangible results of what we're doing, and then build those in time, again, to rebuild the trust relationship. Um, one of the keenest observers of, of Russia in the alliance is uh, Norway's Chief of Defense, Admiral uh, Håkon Bruun Hansen. Mm -hmm. And uh, two, two weeks ago, he and I spoke. And, you know, he made, uh, you know, a couple of points. I mean, one of them is sort of uh, that the Russians have a tendency of not looking at things as a win-win, but it's like a win and, and you lose. That everything is gauged on range and firepower, for example. Um, it's a very hard calculation that doesn't have a lot of soft input. And one of the other points that he made is, you know, the deterrence is very important because the Russians will exploit any opportunity, and once they take that step forward, dislodging them from that is is very difficult. When you're looking at an adversary as, as you did, um, you know, at the head of a very complex 28-voiced alliance, um, you know, do do folks understand that uh, about the Russians, and and what more does the alliance have to do with an adversary that has a tendency of looking at things not as we do? but from a very, very different lens. Well, I think the context is important. We've spent uh, a couple of decades now trying to make a partner out of Russia. And during those decades, we have had very much a proclivity towards soft power and soft power applications. Clearly, uh, we understand now that the Russians do understand hard power and that uh, some, as I said before, credible form of deterrence and the hard power that it takes to do that is absolutely essential in order to have fruitful uh, dialogue. But as I said before, they go together. And so I think that our alliance is beginning to understand those things that clearly uh, signal Russia. And I think that our, our, uh, our interactions in Syria have solidified some of those who, who uh, were thinking about this hard for some time. And so um, I do see the, our alliance and members of the alliance um, beginning to understand what it takes to actually shape Russian thought. Do you think that enough, uh, do you think that the alliance is putting enough investment in the capabilities and the systems, if you're looking at an adversary that respects the hard power, that is methodically building anti-access area denial capabilities from the long range uh, missiles demonstrating the caliber. There was no reason in the world to shoot caliber missiles from the Black Sea, uh, uh, excuse me, from the Caspian Sea. That was sea. a message. Uh, th that was a very powerful message to the Alliance. Is the Alliance responding, from your standpoint, the way that it needs to, to deliver that hard power message to the Russians? So it's a mixed answer, yes and no. Um, what we have seen uh, since Crimea and then Donbass and now certainly Syria is a, a, an awakening among many of the allies towards their investment. Some of the larger nations beginning to uh, now announce their program to invest. Other nations like Poland already in the middle of their investment program. So I'm uh, very much an optimist, over half full, that the alliance has caught up to this, that they need to move forward. I would like to offer maybe a, a slight change in the words that you use. We do need to invest in new capabilities. But frankly, in some cases, we have the capability. We need to invest in capacity. You know, we have a suppression of enemy air defense capability. 
but it's relatively limited because we've been focused on counterinsurgency for 15 years. And now we're going to need to be able to do that suppression of enemy air defense, that long-range precise strike in order to take down these A2AD environments. And so in some instances, it's not new capability, it's capacity of a known capability. But clearly, you have it right. There are new investments we need to make, new capabilities we need in order to address some of these high-end challenges. One of the interesting features of the Russian strategy is sort of the, the notion that the bastion strategy that was such a staple of the Cold War still exists for the Russians. And the notion that it won't take very much to trigger the nuclear ballistic missile submarines to go out and then the attack submarines to defend them and then surface units and to basically create an anti, and, and now with much better air defense missiles that are both from ship and from shore, but also long range cruise missiles becomes a problem in the Norwegian Sea jams up the GI-UK gap, and our whole strategy is keep very for small numbers of forces in Europe. And again, like the Cold War, we want to sort of surge reinforcements that now also have to get through the Baltics to get to Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Poland as well, which is a different dynamic that we didn't have during the Cold War. Um, does the Alliance have the capabilities that in the event a bubble like that goes up to be able to adequately deal with it? So this is something I talked about the last time I was here in Washington, D.C., and that is that I believe, in the grand sense of things, that our last unopposed crossing of the Atlantic is long gone. Um, we will face opposition crossing the Atlantic. And just as you said, it's all of the northern seas understanding and being able to pick up and track and tag those uh, assets coming out of the GIUK GUIC gap, as I call it. Um, these are all things that we haven't really focused on for a long time. Clearly, our naval officers and our naval forces, this, this is not dropped off of their scope, but it's not something that has been the center of our concern. And uh, as I said, I truly believe that the last unopposed crossing of the Atlantic has long passed. And so we, we again, as I said just a few moments ago, we need to keep continuously looking at our capabilities. But this is another capacity issue. We have some very good capabilities, but the capacity is such that they are challenged in many places around the world. And do we have sufficient capacity of aircraft and uh, subsurface craft uh, to address the problem? Do, does everybody in the Alliance sort of universally get the challenge, or are there some folks you think that still didn't fully understand the magnitude of the task at hand. So I actually think everyone understands the challenge, but remember that our alliance is facing uh, what we used to call, and I think NATO still calls strategic direction east, but also, also strategic direction south. And so um, while I think that all of our allies understand the issue, some allies are more pressed by the problem in the south, and some allies are more pressed by the problem in the east. Of course, that both come together in Syria. So um, yes, I do believe that our alliance understands it, but again, we, uh, as Marty Dempsey, before he left as the chairman said, we have to be big enough to handle two problems, and that's what we have now. It's, it's a bit like uh, you know walking and chewing gum at the same time. It is something that we have to do. Um, as you looked at, um, you know, as, 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 as uh, you know, not just uh, Sakura, but as a student of history, um, as you looked at the Russian capabilities and how they've evolved over the past years, uh, looking at it pre-2008 and then Georgia and, and uh, you know, obviously in the multiple phases which people sometimes don't recognize of the Crimea-Ukraine uh, conflict and then to Syria, what's the escalation and growth in Russian forces that you've seen? So what I would say is that the Russian force is a learning and adaptive force. Uh, their, their operations in Georgia in 2008 didn't go very well for a huge country facing a very small country. They learned. They adapted. They were much better at it when they went into Crimea. And they actually learned about how to better hide themselves. Remember how long they denied that they were in Crimea, that the little green men weren't Russian soldiers, um, right up until they admitted it uh, later. But um, they learned from that and got even better at hiding their actions as they went into the Donbass and, and remain in the Donbass and still deny that they're there uh, right up until they said, oh, yeah, we have some volunteers there. But 
the bottom line is they're, they're just vacationing over there. That's correct. So they are a learning and adaptive force, and we have to give them credit for this. And they have, they have yet moved forward even more as they went into Syria. And I agree with you. There weren't a, a lot of operational level reasons to be firing caliber missiles from the Caspian Sea and this, that, and the other. But they're making a statement about the capabilities and the capacities that they've created that are much more aligned with you know, the Western world's forward capability of sensor to shooter with precision. What are some of the specific capabilities that they've demonstrated that most <coughs> concerned you at SACUR and still concern you? Well, um, so these long-range capabilities um, are able to hold at risk many of our ports and airfields that are, are an essential part of reinforcing Europe. Just like I say our last unopposed crossing of the Atlantic has passed, our last reforger-style reinforcement of Europe has passed in an uncontested sense. We will have to be able to defend our airfields, and if unable, we'll have to recover them quickly. We're going to have to be able to defend our ports, and if, and if unable, to recover them quickly, and our railheads, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the range and precision that Russia is beginning to show in these capabilities hold a grand swath of Europe at risk. Uh, so again, our calculus on how we get here and then land and distribute our forces is, uh, is a new challenge. What is the best way, you know, um, the Russians, you know, we, we don't have any tactical nuclear systems. B-61 obviously is, is being refitted. That's largely being done for our allies in, in Europe, but also as part of the triad to have that air delivered um, capability. But if you look at it from a Russian standpoint, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a Russian uh, strategic analyst, and he said, hey, look, you know, virtually everything in our inventory is able to be nuclearized, and we still maintain that capability. Um, you know, you hear the Russians talk about Iskander uh, rattling the nuclear saber. You know, you mentioned that tactical nuclear weapons are part of their war plans. We haven't practiced tactical nuclear. You know, we're, we're increasing, and I want to get to that in a, in a second. But for a company, country that keeps using the N-word, the nuclear word at every turn, how does our messaging need to change at some point? And at what point do we need to consider almost the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons to the region as we did during the Cold War to sort of say, hey, look, guys, come on, we got a rebaseline. And that led to a strategic arms reduction agreement, for example. Well, I think first and foremost, the nuclear capabilities that we have, we need to absolutely do what we are doing, which is keep them current, invest in their viability, and in some cases increase their tactical applicability, et cetera. So the current program's on to make sure that our program is viable believable, dependable. That's first and foremost. Uh, because when you have something that you can believe in, then it is a deterrent. So that, I think, is, is key. As to whether um, we should be reintroducing other types of systems in Europe, I think I'll avoid that and allow our administration to take their shots at how that, how that works. And maybe the new administration, whoever that is, that comes in, this is one of the things that they'll have to deal with. I think they have some tough questions to answer. Very few believe that Russia continues to adhere to the INF. What is our response? What um, do you think when it comes to exercising? You know, a couple of years ago, there were not very many exercises. One of the things that you, some of your counterparts, uh, you know, I think General Palomeros used to discuss this also from a SACT perspective, to sort of increase the nuclear component of exercising and training and preparations, both on a leadership level and otherwise. Do you think that enough progress is being made on that so that political leaders in the region wrap their minds around A2AD, long range strike, and also nuclear? This is really a policy question. Uh, NATO and the United States have a firm, well-known, well-understood um, exercise program to make sure that the nuclear force is viable and that it's capable. Um, and uh, I don't see a, any specific need to change that. Um, and we have a very good conventional exercise program. Of course, the Russians talk about, write about, and exercise the nuclear option as a part of a normal continuum of war. Uh, the West has not chosen to do that. That's the first question that has to be answered by the West. And there are 
there are differing opinions as to whether that is appropriate or not. Um, and if the policy decision that should be taken that we should look at this more like the Russians look at it, then there would need to be some changes. But first we need to let the leaders of the Western nations address the policy issue. Let me ask a cynical question. If you're looking at what the Russians do, the SNAP exercises, for example, um, and you look at the border with NATO, which you know better than I do, but if you look at it from the perspective of messaging, <coughs> you know, we're talking about a few battalions and a few companies and shoes and offices and things like that. They're talking about three armored divisions that are on the border. Uh, we're talking about air defense deployments. Uh, they're talking about triple-digit SAMs that are on the border. Um, aircraft that are in revetments with munitions that are next to those aircraft. Um, from the stamp, from, you know, we're, whereas when you look at it for, from our standpoint, we're looking at, well, in 48 hours, there would be the tripwire, you know. I, is that really ultimately sending the right sort of deterrent message when on the other side of the border, the guy is actually messaging that he's ready to play the A game and you're still, you know, and granted, you know, I, I think it's worked, but what has to change? Does Europe need to get into a mindset in the United States? Hey, look, the whole first fighter wing has got to be within 24 hours bedded down somewhere in Europe at a bear base. So uh, uh, there's a whole lot of questions there. Let me try to dissect them. First and foremost, uh, on exercises, what we really need is just predictability and transparency, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't like the fact that the SNAP exercise might be huge, but if it was transparent when it was happening, why it was happening, when it was going to start, when it was going to end, that sort of thing. It would make it more understandable and bearable. The, the non-openness, the lack of transparency in the exercise program, I think is, is more disturbing even than the size. And, and I take a little offense with the way you, you uh, described our exercises. Yes, our exercises close to the Russian border are small. They are more... Uh, compact in their aspirations of what they're going to accomplish for the reason that we don't want to provoke. But we've had some pretty big exercises back, um, Steadfast Jazz, uh, Trident Juncture 17, et cetera, et cetera. We've had larger exercises. We just do them in a less provocative location. Um, and we, we still have to get better. You know, uh, before Crimea, you probably heard what we, where we were headed when I very first became the SAC here was to, okay, we're coming out of Afghanistan to a large degree, and what is our new raison d'etre? And so we were getting back the large force employment Article 5 exercises. And those big exercises, by the way, were planned then, not as a result of Crimea. But the bottom line is uh, um, transparency, uh, normalcy, understanding, communication, will go a long way to settling this down. Um, clearly, we still have room to grow in the complexity and the size of our exercises. But what I would tell you is um, I don't know what 40,000 troops are doing in a Russian exercise. Are they scrambling out to their local exercise area or are they really getting on the road to do something? I don't know. Uh, and I don't want to start any speculation or, mis or judgment there. But I do know what we're doing in our exercises, in these amphibious exercises we did two years on the northern coast, the, the huge exercise, uh, Trident Juncture, and what we accomplished there. These are high-quality, high-end uh, force, force applications. Be straightforward. I see our exercise program, if there's anything I would add, it might be just a little more uh, volume because what we're doing is getting really quality work. What I saw coming across the, bre the beach in the exercise in the north 18 months or so ago was, was fabulous. This was really good work. Um, and so we're getting what I would call high-end work. Now, um, things that w still worry me is our ability to command and control at scale. How long has it been since either the United States all by itself or any of our uh, partners or allies have done a core level exercise or even a divisional level exercise or in some cases brigade level exercises and so um, and I, I our U.S. Army is all over this our U.S. Marine Corps all over this uh, but it's also about naval gunfire support and an AOC running 
an air war with 2,000 targets in our navy. These are things we haven't practiced in a while. And uh, and I wasn't trying to be critical, but that's sort of the criticism that sometimes has been leveled at the at the alliance, and certainly certainly not at you. But from uh, you know, and, and now that you mention it. Is enough work also being done on emission control operations? Because if you look at the the withering electronic warfare sure. and spectrum stuff that the these Russians are, are doing, these is are tremendous. All things that we're getting about now, and it's all because of what we've learned and what we've seen. The electronic warfare that was carried on on that night when Crimea flipped, and on the first push of the Russians into the Donbas, this is really quite uh, well done. In fact. We've learned a lot about how they use drones and controlling uh, the smirch rocket firings and so forth. And so uh, there's a lot to learn here, and, and we're going to build – we is the wrong personal pronoun. I'm no <laughs> longer the SAC here. I know that NATO is getting after these issues. And, and that the mass fire is, uh, is, is just really uh, – was, was, again, eye-watering, eye as, as, uh, as uh, General Hodges uh, uh, puts it. Um, one Article 5 question. I mean, given all the work that still has to be done, is Article 5 really what has singularly managed to most deter Moscow from further aggression? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough set of words. What I would say is that alliance unity and the alliance's commitment to Article 5, I think, has been a great deterrent. And I think that Mr. Putin does understand the difference between a NATO border and one of the non-NATO borders. Um, at the eve of the Newport summit, um, as the alliance was coming together, making some very, very tough statements, Russia used the opportunity to, to tweak the alliance. So that night they went into Estonia, grabbed the Estonian intelligence officer. They uh, grabbed the Lithuanian fishing boat. Uh, the train broke down in Latvia long enough for the for I think the a Russian brigade commander to say, yeah, about six hours is what is what it would take, which was the message that we would have taken you in in a, in a couple of hours. Um, there are some folks who said that the alliances, alliance not responding to those, was sort of a way for Russia to sort of get away from it. M more broadly, uh, you know, if you can ad address those incidents. But what are the right ways, the mentality of the alliance, to make sure, going back to what Admiral Brun Hansen said, that, the, that there's, there's something that's stopping that next step forward? Well, first of all, I don't want to talk to any one of those individuals. I think you should look at those as a category of events in this incredible information campaign that Russia is carrying, or as I call it, a disinformation campaign that Russia carries on. I mean, those were all very clear statements um, of like shooting those rockets from the Caspian Sea. Um, uh, and I think maybe the alliance showed some, some real uh, savvy in not going overboard. Uh, clearly, they were aimed to make news in the middle of a summit. Um, and, uh, and frankly, the decision makers probably made all the right decisions to just keep moving forward and acknowledge them for what they were. Um, and I think that opens a broader question of, of uh, how well are we addressing the disinformation campaign that's out there and how, how uh, active will we need to be in the future to answer it. You've talked about DIME uh, very articulately over the years, you know, the diplomacy, the information, the military, and the economic. From your standpoint, what's the best way to blend all of these? Is there an order to them? you think that things should go into, and how would you gauge how we've responded so far to some so of much as So much as I said today, um, I, I grade no one's paper. This is a hard business, and our nation has taken the actions that it saw fit to take. I think that what we learn from our opponent is that he's going to have a broad-based approach in all of these categories. If you looked at Ukraine and looked at the great diplomatic pressure to try to discredit the government in Kyiv, keep them in the field so that they can't make the changes that the people want, et cetera, et cetera. The incredible information campaign talking about what uh, the Ukraine army is doing vice what the Russian army and the insurgents are doing. Uh, the, the incredible military support still denying it. I thought it was very instructive this week that the OSC itself came out and said they are dismayed by the fact that 
men, money, and support and continues to pour out of Russia into the Donbass. And then the economic pressures of recalling uh, loans, uh, putting pressure on the uh, fuel and, and energy supplies, turning it off in a couple of cases. What we see is that Russia is, is very good at applying in a broad sense all of the tools against an opponent. And, and we sometimes choose one or two things and do them either modestly or at a, at a, at a greater degree. And maybe we should be looking at a more balanced approach. Would you have a, a blend of capabilities that you'd like to see used? Because there was a debate today about, for example, sanctions. How effective were the sanctions? There are some who say, well, not really. They haven't been kept updated. What's the, what's the, the, the blending you might consider? Well, let's go, back to, let's go back to Ukraine. If we were to draw a diagram, that D-I-N-E, we have a pretty, pretty good effort in the T, in the diplomacy and trying to support our European partners as they work through um, um, the agreements that, that were Minsk and what some called Minsk II and trying to get those worked out. So we have a diplomatic effort. I don't think we've actually taken the battlefield in the information sphere. We are, we are very much behind the power game in, uh, in the information campaign. Militarily, it's, it's no secret that I've, I, have, uh, I have spoken out for more uh, support for direct military support for the Ukrainian uh, military in order to allow them to defend themselves. They, I think every nation has the right to defend itself. And clearly, uh, our approach from the West on the E has been you know, off scale. We, we do have, I think, a good sanction regime in place. But what I, I think what I'm trying to say is a more balanced approach. Get on the field in the information campaign. Begin to respond and reply. And then reconsider, possibly, what our military support is to get a more balanced all the way across the dying uh, model. And do you think the Europeans are going to go for stronger or continued sanctions? Um, I don't know. I, so far, it's been good. I mean, more than once, people have been concerned whether we would maintain the sanctions. I think that, uh, as a minimum, maintaining those that we have is appropriate. Whether we'll see stronger ones, I, I wouldn't want to speculate. Sir, it's always an honor to talk to you. It's great talking to you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you.